Hi, my name's Dale, and welcome back to Metal Tips and Tricks, your YouTube channel dedicated to everything metal. This is part six of the Ultimate Metrology Center, What's in the Drawers? I want to give a shout out to Metal Supermarkets, our new sponsor. I've been shopping with Metal Supermarkets now for the past 10 years. They are the world's largest supplier of small quantity metals. When they contacted me and said they wanted to sponsor my channel, I was so excited because I know with their support, I'm going to be able to do bigger and better projects for you guys. So I want to say thanks to Metal Supermarkets for helping make this video series possible. We're finally to the last video of this series of the Ultimate Metrology Center. This is part six. And I'm really excited about opening these drawers and inviting you in to see what I got. Now, I'm kind of doing this video for two reasons. One is to show off, because I think it's so much fun to show the tools. You know, whenever you go into somebody's shop, one thing you want to start doing is opening the drawers and seeing what they have. And I remember when Mr. Pete did this, boy, maybe three years ago, he did a series of what's in your drawers, and then of course Keith Fenner built on that. And I really enjoyed seeing what was out there. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm kind of showing off. The other thing is I'm kind of putting out what I want to say, some anti-troll traps. Um, I get a lot of comments on some of my videos, especially my bolt hole circle of why I didn't use my DRO or why I didn't use my CNC mill to make that bolt hole circle. The reason I didn't use my CNC mill is because I don't own one. And number two, the reason I didn't use my DRO to figure out the bolt circles because I was trying to show you that you don't need a DRO to do it. Well, in this situation, you will know what measuring equipment that I have so you can go, hey Dale, why didn't you use that particular micrometer or that type of metrology piece? I can come back to you with an intelligent answer, and more than likely the intelligent answer will be because um, I forgot I owned it, or I was too lazy to get it out of the box. So just to let you know, um, you don't need all this stuff to be a machinist, it just makes it interesting and a lot more fun. So here we are at the top of the drawer. I think I'll start over on the right hand side. So here is a Mitsutoyo thread micrometer with all the anvils. Um, great thing to have. Very rare to find these. these. These are pretty expensive when you do find them. Oh, this thing is cool. This is a one inch micrometer. And what it's really set up for is to test. In other words, I can test the tolerances of what I'm working in. And I'll actually have to do a whole video on this micrometer someday. Because what will happen is you can measure with it, get it set to zero, and then you can put other parts in there and see if they're within the tolerance of what you need. This is accurate to 0 .00005 of an inch. So very accurate, interesting tool. Have never really had a situation to use it because I don't do a lot of manufacturing where I have to have a close tolerance on multiple parts. Here was my first digital micrometer. This thing is a tank. It is huge. One of the things I don't, oh, this one does have it. This one actually has an on and off and also has the discs, which can be really valuable for measuring the diameter of like threaded surfaces. I'm going to go on a little rant here. Mitsutoyo, I love their tools. I actually love them over any uh, out there. If you blindfold me and put a bunch of micrometers out or dial calipers, I can tell you which the Mitsutoyo just by the feel of it because they're very silky. But their boxes are garbage. I'm sure you guys have experienced that. I don't use the digital very often. Don't know why. It's just something I've never grown accustomed to. Here's a depth mic. And the depth mic, what makes this one interesting is the blades on it are all flat. Great for getting into the different grooves where round ones won't work. Here's another depth 
gauge. And this one here is an SPI. And you have different anvils, and you can use the dial on here. Very cool, works really, really well. Someday I'm going to have to talk to you guys about calibrating this and understanding the calibration system for them. So here is a Tecum Timico, Timico, Tomico. I can never pronounce these names. You guys know I'm not strong with that. And this is the setup to do to measure interior diameters. And I've got a whole set of rods here. This probably goes up to about 12 inches. Also have the, the handle so you can hold on to it to get in and check. These are a real challenge to use. Often I use it when I absolutely have to and there's no other way. One of the things I'll also do is I will set this up, get it inside, find that sweet spot, check the measurement, and then I'll bring in a micrometer and then check it again just to make sure. These are a little harder to calibrate. Over here we have our brown and sharp. Another depth gauge. Now this one here is for round. The other one, like I said, was flat. Also, the anvil on here is really short, and I'd like to actually get another set of these where I have different size anvils. Uh, sometimes you got to be short, sometimes you got to spread out quite a ways, so you can overcome that with putting it on a set of parallels or something, but it would be nice to not add more air, but just have a larger foot to put that on. So now we're getting to the red box. We have a starret here. This is a number 224. This has interchangeable anvils. So this is technically a six inch, but I can put different anvils in it and bring it down to where it measures to two inches. These are really useful and they're great to have because honestly, I very rarely need a mic of this size. And I chose to go this way just to have, I don't have a big stack of boxes that I don't have room for. I also have another set that goes from I want to say 6 inches to 12 and then 12 to 18. Same setup. Don't use them very often, but when you need to have an 18, you got to have it. A set of snap gauges here. Um, this is not a full set. This is just miscellaneous ones that I've had laying around that I just need to get put into a box. Another Michitoyo. These have interchangeable anvils. What's great about the interchangeable anvils, like right now I have a round pin on here that I can actually measure the inside diameter, or I should say the, the thickness of a wall on a turning or a pipe or something like that. So it's a very interesting tool. Oh, an old wood stare at box. Just, just beautiful to have equipment like this laying around. Don't use it again very often, but when you need it, you need it. And that's kind of one of my themes is there's very few tools you have to have. Um, you know, you have to have a one inch mic, you have to have a six inch uh, dial caliper. But besides that, a lot of the stuff is luxury. Over here is just a nice set of S&K. My brother Terry gave this to me. He found it at Goodwill. Um, it had been in a fire, so it was all covered in black smoke. He cleaned it up, gave it to me. Great gift. Now, I don't know why I have this micrometer head, but I do. It's two inch, it's got some rust on it. Um, I don't even remember where I picked it up. Someday I'm gonna have a jig that I need it for. Same with these here. Someday I'm gonna need them for some project. So this corner here is really set up to what I probably use the most. I've got my one inch stare at here, accurate to a 10,000. I love these brown and sharps. They're actually, they call them a digital mic. And they have a series of numbers here that clock in such a way, I, I want to take one of these apart and show you how it works someday. Really an interesting, interesting system. And they're accurate to 10 thousandths of an inch, really quick and easy to read. They also made a metric version. This was given to me by a gentleman at John Saunders open house last year, so it was 2016. It's metric. I just love having at least one metric tool. Um, I'm going to probably start doing a lot more metric stuff because it is, well, it has some advantages, as a lot of you know. This one here is a Miller Falls, and it has an interesting locking system here, and also the way that you adjust it. 
and set it to be accurate is very interesting. Here's kind of a semi toy made by handy. I don't even know what that means. Half inch. And there's been times I've used this just because I have to get into an area that's really small. One of my favorite mics, believe it or not, is this digital one. I, you pick it up at Harbor Freight. Very cheap. And believe it or not, dead on accurate. I've tested this thing over and over. Very accurate. Its disadvantage is it's very slow to open and close. But if I drop it, I'm not going to be mad. I'm not out hundreds of dollars. I'm only out $30. Over here we have different snap gauges, larger set. Um, I use the snap gauges quite a bit. So over here, a pair of glasses. I need glasses now. So let's go to the next drawer and see what's inside here. So one of the things you're going to see is I have a lot of redundancy. and. It's important because I remember watching somebody on YouTube, I won't say his name, and he dropped a very important measuring tool and he only had one of those. So you'll see that I have doubles of a lot of stuff. Here is a Mitsutoyo. This is probably the only Mitsutoyo box that I have that has stayed together. 12 inch. I also have one of these. It's an s and I don't have it in the drawer right now. It's downstairs. But again, I like redundancy. If I need, if one breaks, I have a backup. Here is a Starrett. Now, I've got to say, this was the very first brand new, and actually, I think the only brand new Starrett item I've ever owned. And it was given to me from a renter that was renting a house that we had in Vancouver, Washington. And he used to be a rep for Starrett. And he said, hey, Dale, I got, a, I got something for you. So he gave it to me. It was still in a sealed box. I was so excited to get it that I set it aside. The next morning, I made my cup of coffee and I carefully unwrapped it. I was so excited. Look at the nice bright red box. Opened it up just, I was almost shaking. I moved it like this and it felt horrible. It felt cheaper than Chinese. Well, and then I look around and I go, oh, made in China. Wow, I gotta say I was really disappointed in that. Now, I think they have a line that's probably the exact TM that is probably Chinese. I don't know. I haven't looked into it, but I got to say stare it. Very, very disappointing to even, you know, we buy you because you're American made or we think you're American made and you're not. So for the people who beat up on me by buying Chinese, well, here's another time made in China. Don't get mad at me for that. Here's a Mitsutoyo digital. You know, it's one of these things, I don't use my Mitsutoyos very often because I'm afraid to break them and they cost so much. And the cheap versions that I have from Harbor Freight, they work. You know, they just work. When I drop them and break them, it's not the end of the world. So, you know, it's one of those things, you, you may get what you pay for, but I think they're a great value. I know people are going to get mad at me for buying, you know, Chinese garbage, but they do work. Here's actually probably the very first one I ever bought. This one actually might be made in Taiwan. It's that old. Doesn't say where it's made, but it's a vernier caliper. I got to say, very nice and smooth. This is before they started making them really, really cheap. Here's some oddball measuring devices for reaching out and around for diameters or you can reach in to look at the thickness of parts. This one here is a little longer. Some of these are really accurate, some of them aren't. They have a place. Um, these are made by Federal so they can be very accurate but you got to learn how to use them to get them to work correctly got my black book in here and I've got it on this top shelf or this one because it fits in this drawer really well and it's on the top area. It wouldn't fit in the other one. My machinist handbook is deeper down because it's so tall. So let's go to drawer number three. Now this one is set up with squares and straight edges. Of course we've got our set of beautifully ground bar Z squares. 
Over here, just a set of Michitoyo. These are a grade B, so they're not super accurate, but they, they work. Brown and sharp. Square, I also have a larger one of these. It's 18, maybe it's 24, I can't remember. Very, very nice. A couple more straight edges. This is where I think I keep my, yeah, my good stare at combination square, so it's always in a box. Doesn't get used much. Different ones laying around. Here's a cute little small stare at. Different uh, straight edges. That kind of stuff is in here. Let's go down another drawer. Oh, this one's cool. This is, well, you can see it. A lot of dial indicators. A lot of dial indicators. Um, also, some bases are in here. I'm not even really sure where to start. I'm sure you guys probably remember the video of making this. Um, well, I keep stealing the, the gauges out of it, but that's okay. My friend Jeff, we did a trade for these. These are different ends or anvils that you can screw on the end of the dial indicators. So let's see, what do we got here? This one here is a Federal. Um, I've taken it apart. I need to send this one in and get it cleaned. Uh, it's accurate to 10 thousandths of an inch. Very cool. I love these large ones. Here's my all-time favorite is this Ames. Again, accurate to 10 thousandths of an inch. And I think it has about a three-quarter of an inch travel. Very rare for something that measures so accurately. This one here is two inches. Just beautiful, and it actually probably matches this one. I've actually never compared it. Let's, let's take a look here. So a one inch and a two inch. Beautiful. I have several of these aims. I actually got a package of them. They are so smooth. Now these have to be clean, but even dirty, these really, really work well. Here is my pride and joy. Now if you don't have an Interrapid, this one here is actually accurate to ten thousandths of an inch. And you can tell when, by looking at them that it's what style it is because of the three screws. Okay. If there's three screws, there's more levers in there, making it more accurate. If there's two, then it's a different, it's either accurate to half a thousandths or a thousandths. If you've never used it in a rapid, you've got to get one. These things are so smooth, so solid, and just a tool that you can trust. It's when I have super critical stuff, that's when I pull that one out. Here's some just odd and ends. Here's a little tiny brown and sharp. Again, ten thousandths. Here is a last word indicator. Now, I know some guys out there just love these last word indicators, Mr. Pete. They are a fantastic device. I own several of them. I'm not sure if I'll get to all of them in here. They are really, really fun to have around. Let's see here. Here's a Federal. Still in the box. Just beautiful. There's just something, I don't know, there's something about these. You know, basically, they started out, these measuring gauges were first being made by watchmakers, which really makes sense because that's, in a sense, what they are. Oh, here's an old mechanical. Um, this one is an, from Ideal Tool. Oh, it's, it, it's a little sticky. But, you know, you can still use these. There's nothing wrong with them. Get over here into a Mitsutoyo box. Here's another last word indicator. Last word indicator. Mitsutoyo accurate to a thousandths. Here is a Craftsman. And it's, it's a copy of the last word indicator. And I just love the brass ring on here. It just has a different look and a different quality to it than the last word indicator from Sterrett. 
Brown and Sharp, or no, this is the best test. Accurate to ten thousandths. Just something beautiful about it. I love the wood box. Another Mitsutoyo. Um, I have to say, this design for Mitsutoyo is not my favorite. Even though I'm a big Mitsutoyo fan, they're just, I don't know, just a little wimpy. I've got a, a bore gauge set here. And it's a cheap one. But there are times that you have to have it, and it's a great way to go to check the interior diameter. Here's a nice full set. I forget what these are called. I call them a button indicator because it's just kind of like a button back here. Beautiful. This is a nice full set. I use it quite a bit, believe it or not. It gets into a situation where you can do more stuff with that. Here is the first indicator I ever got, and it's the same one that is, except look at the gate, the face on it. It's just it got that beautiful old writing on it, the wood box. Really just a prized possession of mine. Here's another bore gauge, cylinder bore gauge. And really what you end up doing with this is you can drop it down inside a bore, and it will line up and keep everything lined up and you can go different diameters with different rods out here. And once you get in there and find that spot, you tighten the knob down, pull it out, and then you can take a measure of it because everything will be locked up and you know what exact size it is. But you can also check to make sure the bore, the taper on the bore or something like that, or if it's round. So interesting little gauge, gets used every once in a while when I'm, of course, working on engines. Here's some more bore gauges. Uh, no, I didn't spend $40 on that. Let's take that off. Um, <laughs> but to just measure very small diameters, just interesting. I ended up buying a lot of about 20 of those. And all different sizes, I just thought it was kind of fun. I've got some uh, Noga arms here, missing the ends. So I'm going to do a video on making ends for those. I think I've got four of these arms missing parts. Um, yeah, here's a two inch Starrett. This is a, also a two inch, but cheap. Let's see what else is in here. It's kind of unique. Here's a beautiful little Starrett. Very short travel. Um, accurate to 10 thousandths of an inch. Just feels really nice. Now one of the things is you want to remember about any sort of indicator is the spring quality is really important when you're working on measurements that are ten thousandths of an inch because if it's pushing too hard against the part it might bend it and deflect it out of position so something to just be aware of here's another interesting mic or dial indicator for measuring the inside diameters now this is a tricky tool to use you have to get calibrated to it and you have to understand it and how it reads. It's a little funky, still struggling with using it. I love the idea of it, I just wish it worked better. Here's a Starrett that is, boy, what's that got a three inch travel on it. So that's drawer number four. Let's go down to drawer number five. Here we are at drawer number five. This is all set up with um, parallels, one, two, three blocks, V blocks, angle blocks, Adjustable parallels. I've got two sets of those. Um, boy, I forgot what's in this box. Oh, it's heavy, whatever it is. Oh, good thick size parallels. Thick size. I think that's a technical term, by the way. We've got different setups of V blocks. Uh, I've actually, very few of these are. I've actually never tested to see how many of them are in, you know, that are true sets. Someday I should do an entire video and show you how to test these, make sure that they're a real set, you know, talk about how the clamps work, you know, why is this particular one set up so strangely? It's about clamping. Here's a planer gauge.
Everybody owns one of these, but very few people use them. I've got two of them. Never have used them. Angle blocks, angle blocks. Now, something you want to be aware of about angle blocks is that some of these will be square on the back and some of them won't. So you need to test them. This one here is actually rough cut, so I know it's not accurate. I'm glad they uh, at least did not try to finish it and pretend that it was square. This here is thin parallels. You need to have a set of those. Some small angle blocks, smaller angle blocks. So let's go down to drawer number six. We have the machinist handbook. The reason it's all the way down here because, well, they're very thick and this was one of the tallest drawers that I could get it into. Um, I have different types of levels in here. I have something in a mystery box. I have some, my dicom is here again. It's what fit. Um, let's talk about levels. Here is a Starrett. This is a, I think it's the 98. Accurate to, I want to say these are accurate to a half a thousandths. Um, great general level. I have two of those. Actually, let me back up here again. Then I have some smaller ones that I've picked up. These are also 98s. I think it's a four and a six. Um, I'm not sure if they hold the same accuracy as a large one. I know some of them do, some of them don't, so these may not be true 98s. Here's one as accurate to uh, half a ten thousandths. Very accurate. It's 12 inches long, made in Poland. The bottom side has been scraped, also V'd out. Incredible machine. I need to still calibrate this one and reflatten it. I will say the way that I have these stored in here is completely wrong. They should be stored just like this top is. They should be sitting on the airy points, two points on one side and one point on the other, so it can handle and adapt to any of the uh, twists that may happen. I have a set of radius gauges. These are Michitoyo. You guys saw these in a video way, I don't know, about two years ago. I got them in a box full of other stuff. I have no case for them. It's kind of disappointing. Here is a brown and sharp sign bar. I'm going to guess that's a six inch. I have several different sign bars in here. Oh, let's get back to levels. I forgot all about this one. This one here, again, made in Poland. And it's a square level. So you can put it up against the surface and see if it's square or 90 degrees to gravity. Very interesting. Accurate to uh, two millimeters. I forget what these are called. I'm sure somebody can leave in the comment what it says on it. This one is accurate to five thousandths of an inch. But what it's set up for is to find the center of a circle when you're working on the milling machine. Interesting tool. When you need it, you have to have it. Gauge blocks, these are actually called, well, People have different names for them, but they're basically a crude set of gauge blocks. I use these probably more than my other set of gauge blocks because I trust them. I've checked these out and they measure out correctly. They also screw together, which is really nice. This set here, cheap Chinese set, is major flaws. Okay, and something you want to be aware of, if you check this row here is basically um, supposed to be within 10 thousandths of an inch, they vary quite a bit and basically they're unusable until you test them and find out where they're at. I need to go through and really test 
dial these in, make sure. The other size are okay, but if I'm measuring ten thousandths, these are not accurate. So just buyer beware. Great for general work. Now for the mystery box. Ah. You guys ready? First the off is you think it is a giant C-clamp. That is not what it is. It actually is a hardness tester, believe it or not. And the way that it works is it works based off a shear pin. So I have a bag of pins here. Let's see if I can pull one out. You put a pin inside here, crank it down, it presses into the steel, and when the pin breaks, the pressure stops, and then you measure how deep the divot is by looking at it with an eyepiece, and you bring it up, measure it out, and you're able to determine in a very accurate way how hard the metal is. Now what's great about this is you can take it to the job site, take it over to a machine, clamp it down, and see where it is. The other thing is you can take the anvil out, do the same thing, but can I take that out? Put it in here, put it up against the piece of metal, hit it with a hammer, and if, when the pin shears, it controls again how much pressure went in there, and you're actually able to test the material right there on location. Very interesting set. They're still available. The uh, shear pins are still available. Um, believe it or not, I found it at an antique store of all places. I was looking at it. I didn't know what it was. Studied it, looked at it for a while, tried to read the sheet on it, went, this is a hardness tester? That doesn't even make sense. Well, that's exactly what it is. And, you know, it does work. And I got enough shear pins with it for the rest of my life. So, just a really interesting tool. Now, let's go to the final drawer. I'm going to open it up. and bring out one of my pride and joys that is sitting here. Um, and we'll set it up here on the table. So this here is my pride and joy. It is a gauge amplifier. And what that basically means, it takes an electronic signal here, or an electric signal, excuse me, it's not electronic, it's an electric signal, and transfers it into here, and we can get incredibly accurate measurements off of this. So accurate that if I set it up on this table, bring the probe, set it up on the table, zero it out, and if I press down on this granite plate, we will actually see the needle move. The tolerance of this machine is 10 millionths of an inch. So what that means, let's, let's simplify that, is if you take a millionth of an inch and stack them 10 high, that's the tolerance of this machine. And it is really fun to work within that kind of degree because you get an understanding of measuring at a completely different level and how much interaction that you have with a part, how much it changes it from you can breathe on a part and watch the needle move when you're measuring that kind of accuracy. This one is incredibly old. It doesn't matter. It still works. I have another one that I'm actually setting up that has two gauges on it so I can get a plus or minus. I can do some just interesting different kind of measurements on it. Fun, fun machines. Now I don't work within the tolerance of what this can measure but I like to have it around so I can start to understand different tolerances at a newer level. Now, one of the things that makes these interesting, a lot of you will go, well, how can you get a mechanical device like this to read so accurate? And what it really does is it has a coil of wire, and the plunger that rides in inside that coil of wire, of course, changes the amperage going around or the voltage, and this picks up those very, very minute changes. Again, this is a gauge amplifier. That's the, that's the key here. So there we go. This is, like I say, about 90% of my collection of metrology stuff. I wanted you guys to see it. I wanted to show it off partially. Also, I want you guys to know 
what I have so when you're looking at it you can question me of why I use certain gauges and why I didn't. All right, you guys, if you like this video, please give me some thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't subscribed. And until next time, go out in your shop, build something cool. Thanks.